You're listening to True Heart. Amy and Scott Mallon dive deep with celebrities, mavericks, visionaries, and real-life heroes to find out what sets their souls on fire. Here's Amy and Scott. What's up, everybody? It's Amy and Scott, and we are back for another amazing episode of the True Heart Podcast. Ride or die. Uh, thank you for watching or listening. And of course you can subscribe to the show wherever podcasts are found. And, uh, we would love it if you left us a great rating, a five-star review. That would mean a lot to us. Also, you can find us on YouTube, uh, if you'd like to watch the show and you can subscribe there as well. And today you are in for such a treat. If you are a Grey's Anatomy and Station 19 super fan like moi, then um, buckle up because today we have got the one and only Jason George who plays Dr. Ben Warren in the Gray Station 19 universe. And not only is he a super talented actor, but he is an absolutely incredible human being who uses his platform for good on a daily basis. We've been blessed to call him a friend over the last decade, and he has been an incredible champion of our favorite causes. So let's check out this amazing chat with Jason George. We're so excited to welcome our friend Jason George to the show. For the better part of the last decade, Jason George has played Dr. Ben Warren on Station 19 and Grey's Anatomy. Over his career, Jason has done well over 50 guest star roles and been a series regular on 10 different primetime shows. He's also starred in films like Barbershop with Anthony Anderson and Ice Cube, Breaking In with Gabriel Union and Playing for Keeps with Gerard Butler. Jason has served over 15 years on the boards of SAG-AFTRA or the now merged SAG-AFTRA. He's also helped negotiate the last 15 years of SAG-AFTRA's contract for primetime television and theatrical film, specifically championing diversity and protections for actors. Jason spends much of his spare time fighting for social justice, better representation, and common sense gun laws. He currently serves on SAG-AFTRA's National Diversity Advisory Committee, speaking about the status and need for diversity in media. Jason also gives back to his Hollywood community peers in crisis by serving on the boards of the Motion Picture Television Fund, Next Gen Committee, and the SAG-AFTRA Foundation Board. He's worked with grassroots movements like Reform LA Jails, serves on the Creative Council of Everytown, and is particularly proud to be a board member of the new bipartisan anti-gun violence organization, the 97%. Jason George, Happy New Year. It is great to see you. Happy New Year to you. Uh, Happy to be here. Happy to be uh, safe in uh, the beginning of 2022. That's right. It seems like uh, everybody's getting this damn thing. Uh, Somebody put out a tweet back in uh, probably the early days of the pandemic where they were like, you know, dear writers of 2020, and now you have to say 21, 22. um, It's too much. It's, it's, you, you, went, you went, you jumped the shark. It was too far. You, uh, <laughs> it was too much with the disease, too much with the, you know, yeah. social unrest. It's, it's, it's a lot. Let's pick a lane. Pick a lane. What story do you want to tell? I completely agree. It's just too much reality. We need a break yeah. from all the reality. Let's just get back to back. living in our delusional yeah. worlds again. <laughs> exactly. That's, well, that's just where I live. That's my job is to be <laughs> in a delusional world. <laughs> and I'm grateful for it because you are so good at your job on Grey's Anatomy and Station 19. And Thank Scott can tell you, Jason, when it's a crossover event, my favorite, it's like a holy night in our house. <laughs> it is. I tell him, like, I can't watch it the next day on Hulu because, you know, some of the fans, they don't understand the concept of like West Coast spoilers. So, yeah. you know, yeah. they run their mouths and then the show's kind of ruined. So I have to watch the station 19 and Gray's crossovers live every time. And yeah. so she's not kidding, by the way. It's, true. She's not no, just no, it's that. a real thing. It's a real thing. I remember like uh, years ago when we first started live tweeting, when we first started live tweeting during the shows, uh, I had jumped on and I was a fan of scandal and I hadn't caught the episode of scandal that night yet. I said, well, no, no more spoilers. I said, well, hold on. I haven't seen the episode yet. And literally my own castmates and friends from scandal who were live tweeting for that show Shonda, they all like hit me. We're like, well, then get up freaking Twitter. 
like, get off of social media. They're like, it's not our fault. It gets on you. No, I was like, okay. okay. So yeah, you got to be in that. a bubble. You got to be in a little bubble if you, you don't want the spoilers. Complete and utter media. There are only two times in my, you know, like, it's funny. You know, media lockouts happen for Station 19 Grey's Nights and for sports. Like if I am someplace and I can't record, you know, my Philadelphia Eagles or the Los Angeles Lakers or the Dodgers, I go into media blackout. Uh, and the only other time it happens in my house is, you know, for uh, the Gray's Anatomy Station 19 world where, you know, because my, my kids watch, you know, my wife watches. Uh, I watch with them and it becomes new again for me because I get to watch with them. And we shut it down. She's like, like nobody say, la, 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 la. don't say nothing. Don't look at social media until we've actually... Watch the episode, and then they get on. I have to ask you, so what is it like to watch yourself? Like, what is that like to watch it back and be like, well, I was there, but now I'm watching it, and it's, like, different, right? Because there's no cameras there, and it's, like, now it feels, like, real when you watch it. Is it, like, weird to watch yourself? It's weird. I mean, look, it's weird, but at the same time, it's it's different for every actor. Uh, Some actors absolutely hate watching themselves because they're constantly critiquing themselves. I like to think that I'm actually pretty good at being able to be objective and say what's satisfactory without being satisfied. Like that, uh, that didn't suck. You know what I mean, could I do better? You can always do better, but you know, there's in some actors will just make themselves crazy. When I'm performing, I will make myself crazy. I'll do a million takes. If you let me, I'll just go, I'll, you know, uh, and work at it all day. So watching and, and but that object, that objectivity is one of the things that I'm hoping will be a strength for me when I'm actually directing my first episode later this season. Uh, oh, wow. very, very excited. I think you're the first time I've actually said that on any kind of media. I don't know that I've said that out loud publicly besides to like family and dear, dear friends. Uh, not that you're not dear friends, but, uh, but, I, but I, that objectivity to be able to say, uh, cause you know, you've only got so many hours in a shoot day and you got to make your day and everybody's trying to go. So to be able to like gear up and make it happen, but that objectivity to be able to say, that's it. That's, that's the show. That's what this scene needs. We're moving on. Even though people might want another take or this and your thing, or there are things that, you know, you can, you can let perfect be the enemy of good. And there's no such thing as perfect. Even though this is what I do for a living. If the show gets to a point, if the movie or TV show gets to a point where they get me talking back to my own screen, knowing that this is what I do for a living. If I get to the point where like, if I see that actor on the street, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk crazy to him. They did their job. You know, similarly, if I was on set shooting the episode of Grey's Anatomy, shooting the episode of Station 19, and they get me excited and anxious or weepy or whatever, I know the show's working because I know what happens. You know, so if you got me, you did it right, Uh, which is a mark of a good, you know, any good story is when you can hear it again and again. You know, I mean, think about those movies and TV shows that you go, go back and watch like Comfort Food. If it still gets you, that's a classic. You know I mean, that's when you know it's classic. And I feel like I like to believe, knock wood, that Station 19 and Grey's Anatomy hit that more often than not. So that for me is, is the barometer of I, I get to watch. I watch them almost more than I watch the show, but I also still watch and enjoy it. And when I get really engrossed and start getting emotional like everybody else, I'm like, I know y'all killed it because I, w- I shot the daggone thing. Yeah, well, I'll come. I'll come in at the end. You know, like Amy's got like the candles and like the whole thing. No, I'm just kidding. But it's like a, it's like a really yeah, bubble bath in the background. Yeah, exactly. But it's, so don't come in. It's legit, like a visceral experience when I watch Station 19 and Grace. It's a, it's a roller coaster of emotions. Sometimes I'm like screaming at the TV. Sometimes yeah. I'm like completely sobbing. Or I've like just gotten a sweat, like I left my hot yoga class because I'm on the edge of my seat, like what the hell's about to happen? So it really like runs the gamut of emotions. And to your point, I think that that makes for really great art. And and even obviously knowing you and being friends for a decade, like watching the show, I'm still so immersed in your story as Ben that in the commercial breaks, I have to remind myself, like, I know Jason's still alive because I just <laughs> texted him. He's okay. You know, He's okay. <laughs> it's not real. It's, you know, this this universe that, you know, the talented Shonda Rhimes and everyone that works on the show has done 
such an amazing job of really creating and getting people invested in, you know, coming on what this is season 16, right? Of Grace. No, Grace, this is season uh, 18. 18. 18. Just right. got picked up, just got picked up yesterday officially for yes. season 19. Woo! And station wow. just got picked up officially for season six. Congrats. So, so we only got 13 more of 19 of station 19. <laughs> you know, I think 19 seasons of 19, right? Nice. Well, that's a good yeah. goal. That's a good goal. Well, and and speaking of Station 19 and Grey's Anatomy, so the winter finale left us on a literal cliffhanger, right? Owen was in this car that went off a cliff, and his fate is unknown. Then we cut to this trailer for the the crossover Station 19 Grey's Anatomy uh, events coming up on February 24th, which I'm very excited about. And we see you, my friend, <laughs> rappelling down a hundred foot mountain saying you're going to go save your friend. So without revealing any spoilers, what can we expect when these shows come back in a few weeks? Um, well, the crossover is going to be off the chain. I mean, it really is. It's, uh, you know, you know, the thing about Grays and Station 19, Shonda was at the forefront of that whole thing where Showrunners were not afraid to have major characters die. Uh, and that made real stakes. You knew that you're, you know, back in the day, you know, when I was watching, you know, I mean, I didn't think we show, uh, you know, 24. You know, if Keith and Sutherland, they've got him pinned down, they got a gun at his head. All I'm thinking is, I wonder how he gets out of this. Because by the right. way, we're only on episode 12 of 24 episodes. I know yeah. he gets out of this. <laughs> uh, you know? yeah. um, but with Station 19 and Grey's, you don't know anything of the sort. So that's one of the things that early on, you know, which by the way, for job security, not the greatest thing for an actor. <laughs> but, um, you know, it tells the best story. And that's the thing that we love and that uh, it brings a stake. So we're, we're you know, we're, we're good with the, we're like, just, just give a phone call. If I'm gonna die, just give me a phone call and let me know ahead of time. I don't wanna find out at the table read uh, that I'm catching a bullet. So this one coming up, Owen's off the thing and it's it was a, well, ask me because I have such a great personal relationship with Kevin McKidd, who plays Owen Hunt. Uh, we're friends off screen and on screen. Our characters being friends is this, you know, huge bonus. So when I found out that it was uh, Kevin going to be in Jeopardy, that Owen is in Jeopardy, uh, I was like, and, and what does Ben do? They said Ben starts breaking rules. Ben stops <laughs> says this being orders because Ben's going to do what Ben does because it's a friend in Jeopardy, and that is super fun for me. Uh, you know, I mean, I look, I love to do all this stuff. That was one of the fun things about transitioning from Grays to Station 19 was the opportunity to play in a sandbox. I mean, don't get me wrong. Grays Anatomy, all the emotional stuff, the great speeches, but from an acting perspective, you also, by the way, spend your entire day in pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> you're in pajamas and you're, you know, in somebody's chest and it's all about eye acting, important eye looks and that sort of thing. And these moments uh, where Station 19 we're literally wearing 40 pounds of gear. Pajamas, 40 pounds of gear, seven pound helmet, oxygen tank, yo, know, and we're like running upstairs and running on things. And so I actually dig that. And so it was a fun, you know, change. And I'm sure when I'm like, you know, 70 and, you know, years old and season 110 or whatever, you know, <laughs> that I'll be like, okay, let the young kids run up the thing, get them put on the gear. But uh, I love doing the action stuff. So whenever it comes up, you know, when they said he goes off of a cliff, and I'm like, what has Ben doing? They said, well, Ben goes rogue. Ben starts breaking rules, and Ben repels off the thing. I was like, yes. And you know, <laughs> I was like, as usual, I'm like, I have a stunt guy there ready to double me. And then when they show up, I turn to the stunt guy and I go, we're never going to use you. I'm doing all of this. Nice. And you know, and they give me the ropes, they give me the stuff, and we have, you know, our stunt leader Steve is fantastic, and you know, so I get to, you know, it was super fun, and you know, I know the. First AD and the you know directors if they've been around they get a little nervous because they don't know that I'm gonna like go off. Uh, the producers start to sweat a little bit because they're like, just watch because J- Jason's gonna try and do things that probably he shouldn't be doing. So, you know, <laughs> but hey, you know if you're do I mean look I'm not trying to get you to do anything dangerous but when you're doing it it probably helps the shot right because it is you know they can do different shots because you're doing it so it probably it, looks absolutely. even better. It makes it it makes it cut together better, and the other part is it uh it gets you as an actor amped. I mean, anytime you feel like you can do something even close to approximating what the the the, the actual people do, the actual first responders doing, I, I I can't do what they do, but when I come close to it, and you can make it look when they look at you, and they go, 
Like there are times when a uh, firefighters have to enter a building. You know, they they're taking out the windows. They're not take, knocking in doors. There's a, w- a way they do it. They do it with a little bit of swagger that makes you believe. You know, you do that for a living. Like when they kick, when you kick in a door, you can tell when somebody's like, I've never kicked in a door. I just need it, and they just step in, and you can tell when they're just like, it's Tuesday. Wow, and the door goes in. <laughs> when we get to do those, and when our you know our our tech people, our uh, consulting you know uh, technicians, are, are, they go. Yes, that's the way you do it. And you can do, you know, the fun part is when they give you stuff to do in a speech and like we're like smashing out windows while having a speech about like, you know, do you want to, you know, adopt a baby? You know, we want, you know, do you want to have kids or not? You're just smashing out windows while you're doing it, breaking stuff, hacking stuff. That's the fun stuff to like, you know, get the physical stuff. So, yeah, it, it would all that stuff. The more you can do it, it helps the editing. Uh, it tells the story better. And it also helps you believe in this character that much more you know there's a way that a there's a way a firefighter walks into a room that other people don't walk in firefighters walk in to a restaurant with a certain kind of swagger and they're checking exits they know how to get out of any room they're in always mm-hmm. and it's just the thing you begin to pick up and you're just like i need to know that when walking walk into rooms as a part of me clocking exits you know and that's a firefighter thing so it's fun i, I love it just two quick things Number one, if I was on the show, I'd be like, guys, let's just make sure this this door is made out of paper. So when I come in and knock it down, like I don't get knocked back and like knocked on my ass. That's number number one. Number two, this is just these are just no, this is just tips. I use them, don't use them. It's fine. And number two, you know, if you're 70 and you're still on the show and it's season, you know, 64 of, of Station 19. Or 120. They just forklift you up there. So just, you know, it's like a beep, beep, beep. <laughs> it's cool. They, we can make it work. I'm just saying. Like, it doesn't matter how old you are. We can make it work that you stay yeah. on Station 19 forever. Don't sleep because well, I figure when it's when it's season you know eighty of Station Nineteen and it'll be season uh, one hundred and ten of Grace um, <laughs> or whatever. So it, uh, you know, ninety five of Grace. You know, but look, and there's always hope because look at Jim Pickens. Jim Pickens is you know Chief Weber. That's right. Uh, and you know, what, what his official amazing. title is, Doctor right. Weber will always be Chief, um, <laughs> even if Bailey's Chief, Weber's Chief. Um, <laughs> In the world, he's cheap. Uh, you know, I mean, Jim. Jim has like been doing it for a minute, and he's he's truly goals. Jim is truly goals. It's like I want to him and his lovely wife. It's like that's I want to be acting like that when I when I got you know a, a, a few more gray hairs up in there. You know, we've had some really nice conversations with with Jim and his wife at our charity events over the years, and. What I love learning most about him that I think people um, would not expect is that he is super into rodeo. He is a legit cowboy. He's and a cowboy. It's real deal. He's real yeah. deal cowboy. He, he's, he's got like the full getup. He, he <laughs> spent a half hour telling me all about the rodeo because I had actually been to a few rodeos back in the day with a client. And so we were swapping rodeo stories. But like that is is his thing. He loves it. It was so <laughs> cool. Was- they, he loves it and they love him and he is legit about it. And like, you know, he's like, he's, you know, he's like, yeah, he's not 25 years old. Get him on a horse. And guess what? It's game on. Good luck. Yeah. You got, you got, you got, you got to work to keep up with Jim. As soon as you get anywhere near the rodeo, it, uh, a horse, you know, it, Jim's legit. He's a, uh, which I love about him. And he's, you know, he's, and this is the other thing that people forget. Jim Pickens has been there, done that. Like when Denzel came to direct the episode, Everybody's like freaked out. Denzel's coming, everything like that. He's trying to put on their A game and whatnot. Denzel rolls in and he looks at Jimmy. He goes, "What's up, Pick?" He calls him Pick. He calls him Pick because that's what everybody back in the day. If you see Samuel Jackson, "What's up, Pick?" You forget Jim Pickens been there, done that. That's so cool. You know, he is the chief. He is the chief. Yeah, he's uh, he's amazing, and he's you know he's OG. Uh, Grace, one of the one of the last greats of the show from the original cast, um, along with the very talented Chandra Wilson, who plays yeah. your lovely wife on the show, <laughs> Miranda Bailey. So you guys are this ride or die couple, Miranda and Ben. Like us. Like us. Ride or die. Ride or die. We, ride or die. We always say that. <laughs> See how I always get that in? I always get it in. You got you to gotta right. remind her. You got to make sure you're like, yeah. We're still ride or die, right? We, okay. Yeah, all right. Right. Or die. All right. Good. And so, um, you know, on the show, your characters have been through so much together. So 
why do you think, you know, Miranda and Ben are still magic all these years later? And then off screen, what are you and Chandra doing to really keep that chemistry as a TV couple going? Well, it's truly acting because she's not a particularly nice person and I don't like her very much. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the acting, it's a testament to my acting abilities that we look at. <laughs> Uh, no, Don't worry, no one will know. This is just between me, you, and yeah. everybody out there. No, she's she's just fantastic. Um, look, I yo, know, this is not my first rodeo, and even when I first got on the show, I've been banging around for a minute. But uh, I remember my wife first showed me DVDs of uh, this is the pre streaming this is DVD days, right? Uh, a friend got her the box set of Grey's and probably she started watching probably in season three and she was catching up from the beginning of season of season one. And she came in and said, you need to watch this. And I said, what? She said, this is, you, you need to watch this show. And we checked it out and I watched a show that was able to do crazy comedy at points and then intense drama at other points, blend them seamlessly. And the more comedy, they would, they would use comedy to buy a little bit more heightened drama and they would use the drama to then uh you know in the middle of this funny moment like drop you into it into tears in a dramatic piece and the way they would fade them off of each other is like you know it's, it's like it's like your treble and bass is they would do amazing things and i was like i need to be on the show they'd be they were writing speeches in the show that like actors want their entire career you want to do some shakespeare because you want to attack those speeches and then in modern day you want to do Shonda Rhimes or Aaron Sorkin. You want to do, you know, these are people writing speeches that good luck. Like you need to put on your big boy acting pants and yeah. go get it. I was like, I want to be on that show. And then a couple years later, I end up on that show. And uh, I'm thinking, don't screw this up. Don't <laughs> screw this up. And so I hadn't been nervous on a set for a minute. And it was the first time I felt nervous for a little bit. I was like, oh, I remember this feeling. Cause I want this, cause I want this to work out. And, uh, and I was just supposed to do a few guest spots, but Chandra and I just had an easy give and take from day one, moment one, playfulness. We mess with each other and uh, in this beautiful way while supporting each other. It's like, if you're, you know, if you're playing tennis, you don't want to be just a, a limp, just across, just, just get it across. And I want to rocket something at you. So I, so I, I want you to come at me. So I come back at you, uh, serve you back and forth, come with the heat and, uh, and everything I throw at her, she hits right back at me. She's every bit as smart as Bailey seems on camera, and we just have a great time. It just make it easy. It's like you know. So uh, the the thing you know, directors, guest directors come through the shows all the time, and the producers, especially the producing director, give them kind of the uh, the secret code to each actor. Like this is how this actor gets down. This is the way, this is what they approach. This, this actor loves to rehearse. This actor wants to be more spontaneous. Whatever, whatever, right? Uh, and they, uh, the thing I'd heard, and this was one of the greatest compliments. They said when it comes to Jason and Chandra in the scene together, they go, "Yeah, just let them do what they do. Just let them go." And that to me was like one of the greatest compliments I'd ever heard. And the director shared that with me one time. He said they just kind of told me to like get out of the way <laughs> to like tell you where I needed you to start anywhere in particular I need you to be and then get out of the way. And I was like, that was a huge compliment. So, uh, yeah, we've been together for, I think Ben was supposed to do four episodes. I've heard this story and who knows the truth, but I heard the story that Ben was supposed to do four episodes and then kind of do Bailey dirty and then go on his way. Uh, like, you know, dog her out and be out. And then, uh, I think they saw, a spark of something fun with Chandra and I. And, uh, and so, you know, we've been hanging out for a few years since. I I'm so glad that they saw that because I remember the first episode when, you know, you were the anesthesiologist and that, the gas was, man. The and gas that man. was introduced and, and there was that flirtation between you two and, and, you know, Miranda was kind of like, wait, is this the real thing? Like, is he into me? Is he checking me out? And, it was just this like beautiful love story that blossomed from it. And I think of all the, you know, couples that are on the Grays and the Station 19 kind of universes now, I think in that world, you guys are like couple goals. You know, you guys are <laughs> are are rock solid, which is um which is amazing. And so yeah. let's do some rapid fire uh Grays Station 19 questions. So 
out of both casts off screen, who's the funniest? Jay Hayden. He seems like he's uh, he's a funny guy. He's a fool. He's a fool. He's ridiculous. He's uh he's he's just kind of designed for comedy. Uh, deep deep well of emotion in in the guy, which he brings out in the character when he needs to. But also just anytime you get you know when the conversation accidentally veers into like something serious, Jay, you know, will he, he has a huge huge heart. Uh, but then you know after like you know we're, you know you're having this like truly heartfelt conversation, then some ridiculous joke you know blows it apart and. And we're laughing again. So yeah, Jay's uh, Jay's pretty good that way. Who is the biggest prankster? Biggest prankster. Um. Wow, that's a uh, that's hard. I mean, it might be it might be Boris Kojo might be Boris is in there. Uh, I think Boris has a tendency to, as soon as he's off camera, he's going to mess with you. So we've all trained ourselves to ignore Boris the instant. Like if he's in the scene, as soon as he walks off camera, he'll turn around and be like, ah, and be messing with everybody. And we've all been like, ignore Boris. Do not pay attention to Boris. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I, I, I think I'll go with Boris on that one. We love Boris. I got I to gotta tell this quick story of Boris. So he was at one of our events. He was and, in our fashion show yeah, with Nicole. Yeah. And I mean, like, I'm, I, you know, I look in the mirror and I'm like, eh, all right, whatever. And <laughs> I was standing next to Boris and I was like, what the fuck with this guy? Like, I was like, this is, I have never felt so inadequate. I was like, he's tall. He's got like this crazy, like built body. He looks like a Greek God. It was not yeah, cool. I didn't like standing next to him. I was like, get this guy away from me. He go you, over I there. Try, try working with him. Try working with the man. No, he's, uh, and he's, he's designed on an island someplace. He was designed, he and Nicole were both designed on an island and sent here to embarrass folks, to, uh, to, <laughs> to, you know, <laughs> maybe give you goals, but also make you just be like, really? It's too much. It's too much. Again, but, you know, there's goals. <laughs> there's goals. It's like, oh, I, this guy looks good. I'm a, he's he's motivating me. This was like deflating. I was like, there's no chance. I don't care. <laughs> I can live in the gym. This will never happen. I was like, so just who cares? And I was you like, just I just started eating. Like, I was like, ah, <laughs> screw it. He screwed up my goals. Whatever. All right. Two more. Um, who do you miss most that left either show? Uh wow, that's that's um I love Miguel Sandoval. Uh we had a great time. He's an OG actor. He's been around, I mean, he dude was in Miami Vice back. You know, he's he's been there, done that. He's uh Latino acting royalty, Latinx acting royalty. And then uh but the first one that came to mind, to be perfectly honest, Sandra O. Because uh, we we overlapped on the show for a few years, but it was I was more recurring at the time, and so anytime I was on, I was really mostly with uh, Chandra. It was before I become more part of the central cast, and then uh, and we did we never had that many scenes together. We were always in different sections of the show and just wave at each other and give each other love. And you know, last time I saw her was at an award show, and she goes, ah, we just you know just hugged up and everything like that. But uh, she's a ridiculously talented actress, and uh, I just I I would just love to have had more scenes with her. So that's why. And finally, um, what's one thing that you secretly hope Ben gets to do, um, either in the Grays or Station 19 universe? Oh, wow. Secretly gets to do. I don't know. I mean, he's, he's, he's done a lot of things. and They've got so many things like to, you know what, let's, um, let's, let's say perform surgery while in a fire. Like not like, you know, <laughs> fire around him. In, and he's just throwing, turning, and just just going for it. I'm just, I'm, I'm pitching a scene right now. I like like in a blaze yeah. of fire, like in yeah, a circle I, around him. The, encircled in fire. No, no, not today. Not today. <laughs> not on my watch. I need 10 cc stat. <laughs> Is that even a thing? I don't know. It, he looks like, around. The nurses are gone. The nurses gone. are. Dead. They're, they're like, they're, what they're, are you doing in the fire, like, man? <laughs> <laughs> Where's my IV? Right. They're like, the oxygen is going to explode. No, <laughs> I'm out. So you're saying there's a chance we'll see that next season. <laughs> I'm pitching. I'm, I'm pitching it tomorrow. <laughs> awesome. I like it. This Saves Lives is a ridiculously delicious food brand that gives back. Every single purchase sends life-saving food to a child in need. Co-founders Kristen Bell, Ryan Devlin, Todd Grinnell, and Ravi Patel launched This Saves Lives with a simple motto. Buy a bar, feed a child, we eat together. 
Now with more than just bars, their products contain premium ingredients and are non-GMO, gluten-free, and kosher dairy. Their unique line of kids' products all contain one full serving of fruits and vegetables and are safe for school. To buy their ridiculously delicious snacks, head on over to thissaveslives.com. Are you still wiping your butt with all that toilet paper you hoarded last year? How's that going for you? Let me introduce you to a new way to clean after you handle your business. Meet Hello Tushy. Tushy is the modern bidet that easily clips to any toilet and installs in just 10 minutes. Starting at just $99, Tushy sprays a precise stream of clean water and washes away all of that literal crap that toilet paper leaves behind. Upgrade your bathroom experience by going to hellotushy, T-U-S-H-Y dot com. That's hellotushy.com. Tushy saves the environment and reduces your carbon butt print. Tushy saves you money on toilet paper and Tushy saves your butt. Go to Hello Tushy, that's T U S H Y dot com. Stop wiping, start washing with Tushy. For over a decade, lifestyle brand Half United has been using fashion to feed people all over the world. To break the cycle of generational poverty, the community provides gainful employment to local artisans and vulnerable communities who create their handmade and sustainable products. For every Half United product purchase, seven meals are given to a child in need. Half United has donated over one million meals to date. Shop their beautiful jewelry, tees, handbags, and home accessories at halfunited.com and help fight global hunger. Say ciao to tradition and hello to your new favorite plant-based Italian bistro in Los Angeles, Brothers Meatballs. Brothers Meatballs was founded by brothers and food industry veterans Mauro and Sergio Corbia, who hail from the Isle of Sardinia, Italy. When they joined forces with second-generation Italian chef Mark Middleman, their self-proclaimed brother from another mother, the concept for Brothers Meatballs was born. Moro was the founder and creator of Moro's Cafe inside Fred Siegel, a long-standing LA hotspot. Dissatisfied with the amount of plant-based dining options, reminiscent of the home-cooked meals their mother once made, the brothers were determined to create a menu so delicious it would appeal to herbivores and omnivores alike. Inspired by the food mama so lovingly prepared for Sunday suppers, these meatballs are a modern take on a family classic. All menu items are 100% plant-based and made with mama's secret ingredient, love. Angelinos can order lunch and dinner Wednesday through Sunday at brothersmeatballs.com. Now let's get to the heart of why you're here, um, which is your heart, not to make a a bad pun there, but um, you have this big, beautiful heart and you use your platform for good. You're constantly donating your time and talent to all of these amazing causes over the last decade. We've been blessed by your generosity as an ambassador of many of our social impact campaigns, and you've attended so many of our charity events. And so what inspires you to give back? Wow. Um, I mean, you know, as long as there's need, I feel like we all need to be doing something. I mean, it's like if you see a need and you don't reach out or at least want to reach out, then you've kind of lost your humanity. So what the hell? That's just a sad state of affairs uh, for you as a, as a person. Uh, but, you know, I mean, for me, it all started with my mom. You know, my mom is, was a teacher. She taught learning disabled kids uh, in, uh, you know, Norfolk, which is if you live in, uh, you know, has, has its inner city section and that sort of thing. And she um, she was just amazing. You know, uh, my neighbor across the street had uh, had Down syndrome, and it was so normal for like he was the kid that everybody wanted on their football team because he was also stronger than all of us, <laughs> like beyond belief. And so, uh, watching my kid, my mom with the kids that she worked with, and you know, having you know, John Pulpus as as a neighbor, you know, that's the thing that started where you're just like, everybody's different, and everybody has a beautiful thing inside of them. And so, you know, and everybody has needs, you know, even when you, even the people who look like they don't actually do, they just hide it better than most of us. Uh, so it was, how do I reach out and try and help somebody's needs? So I would watch my mom do that. I watched her do all these, uh, all these philanthropic endeavors that she did. Cause you know, while she was a teacher, she was president of the teacher's union would use as an opportunity to speak out about social issues and that sort of thing. And where I grew up and 
never afraid to speak truth to power. I would watch my mom, Shirley George, just, you know, every principal I ever had was afraid of her. Um, because if, if they, you know, discipline my child, you know, if I screwed up a school, which was common, by the way, um, my mom had some bad tail kids who would get into trouble. We were good kids, but we were mischievous kids. Uh, but the principal had to come at us right. Cause if he was, you know, if you're, if he's educating us on how to do, how to be better, you get away with it. You're good. If he's just, uh, you know, all the terms that parents know now, like if he's just punishing, if he's just uh, getting, if he's, if he's feeling powerful, if he's enjoying his power by lording it over some kids, which by the way happens, uh, she shuts it down. She shuts it down. And, uh, you know, and so that for me was one of those things where I was like, never be afraid. I don't care who you are. I don't care what kind of power you have over me or mine. I will tell you the truth. Uh, and I will come at you. And the other part is there are people out there who need you to, you know, see them, you know? So it started with, like I said, you know, my neighbor and my mom's kids. And so, you know, when I first started doing, uh, the first medical show I did for Shonda Rhimes was, a uh, uh, set in, uh, the jungle and a character with pediatric cancer, uh, character was a little girl with, uh, cancer comes on the show and the parents are adopting her. And then one of the parents bails cause she's freaked out. I can't deal with all this. And the other, and the husband leaves her. He's like, no, I knew the moment I saw her, that's my child. I'm supposed to be, she's supposed to be my child. And it's this beautiful, beautiful story of selflessness. Um, and I, and it was right at the beginning of the whole social media beginnings. And I'm, you know, I didn't know if I want to even get involved in this whole social media thing. I don't want to, you know, I was like, it just seems like a whole lot of opportunities for people to just yell at you. It seems like a lot of ridiculousness. And then this pediatric cancer community reached out to me and just reached, reached down my throat, grabbed my heart and just ripped it wide open. And, uh, I became dear friends with, you know, so many different families and I've lost some dear little friends, uh, and, you know, and still keep up with their, you know, their families. And that was my first realization that a social media isn't pure garbage. Uh, B that this thing that I do, that I love to do almost mostly for myself to learn about what I'm capable of by playing somebody else really does put, give people an opportunity to be seen. Uh, not just representation when it comes to, you know, gender, yeah, LGBTQ racial issues, but you know, people who learn differently, people who have diseases, communities that feel like they're not being seen because of the issues that they have to deal with, like pediatric cancer. And, and so it blew my world open. And so, you know, and then you find that love and then that love becomes an addiction and you just stay with them and you try and support them and uh and try and stay in the mix. And you know, and then you also you get a platform and you use it to speak out to folks, you know what I mean? To say what you think is right in the world. That said, you know, I think everybody has a right to speak. You just got to be prepared to back it up. Too many people speak and they just, you know, because I said so, and it's like, well, why? They're not really ready to have a challenge. They haven't challenged their own idea before they say what they think about the world. You got to think before you speak, especially on social media. Absolutely. Well, it certainly helps that you're like incredibly and insanely eloquent and you're pretty smart. So <laughs> it, it, it helps like when you, you know, speak, you have a, a, an authority to it because you've done the research. We know behind the scenes when you are going to do something, you're like, send me everything. I want to know all of it. I want to read it. I want to know it. You'll spend hours and hours researching, thinking about it. That's you, you know, and that's rare. So well, thank you. And you mentioned, Jason, obviously your passion for helping the pediatric cancer community. And that reminds me of one special little girl that I was so proud we were able to help together, your friend Jaden, um, who, you know, had this dream to meet Selena Gomez. And you rang me up and I said, yeah, we got to we got to team up and make her her wish come true. And so, you know, Jaden spent nine and a half years battling aggressive brain cancer and sadly um, passed away at just 15 years old a few years ago. But I wonder from your friendship with Jaden, who inspired millions of people and was such a bright light in the world, what did you learn from her or some of the other kids that you've met through your work with 
Children's Miracle Network Hospitals and St. Baldrick's Foundation and all of the other amazing pediatric cancer uh, groups that you've supported over the years? Well, first off, her full name is Supergirl Jaden. That's, that's right. Her, that's her full name, Supergirl Jaden. Uh, and she was physically 15, but she was uh, emotionally, she, she was, you know, 35. She was uh, amazing. She was teaching all of us, and we would fight, you know, you know, I, I would fight a Baldwin brother, and these, you know, over who was her best friend. Um, <laughs> I was. Uh, I have a hat of her. her, her I have one of her. Uh, you know, I'm a grown ass man, but I have this little stuffed doll that sits uh, up with all my hats from all the different, like, you know, events that I've been to to support things and that sort of thing, along with like, you know. <laughs> That's her eagles, like, like this pink monkey that like his mom after she passed, and uh, and it's you know the remembrance that like you know whatever you whatever problem you got going on today, it's not that deep. It's a it's still a real problem. It's still a real problem. You got to deal with it, but that objectivity, perspective, Jaden slaps everything. Jaden's big superpower was to instantly give you perspective because when you'd be at those events, Jaden was the first one on the dance floor. Half of her body doesn't move very well, um, but she's the first one on the dance floor and she's going hard. And <laughs> you have no you have no excuse. I don't yeah, I don't care that you didn't get that job that you wanted. You know, she, she's been staring down death for a minute. And so and then her other big lesson was uh was you know fear is bullshit. You know, like, you know, look, it's, it's going to do what it does and you can only do what you do, you know, and she just reinforced to me the you know, this adage that I lived at, long, you know, long when I was a teenager, I remember somebody saying, you know, there's two things in this world that you cannot sweat, that you cannot worry about. Don't worry about those things that you can't control because it's out of your control. And those things you can because you will. And it's just that simple. Uh, everything that you can affect, do it. Get it done. Go at it. Jaden spoke in front of, uh, she spoke, she would speak to the president like he was their neighbor. Like, yo, I got a problem with you. <laughs> the leader of the free world. You can't <laughs> say that. She does not care. She does not care. Uh, never disrespectful, but she was never afraid to say whatever needed to get said and do whatever she felt like doing and have fun and you know, uh, and what people thought of her. She wasn't, she just wasn't afraid. So fear is bullshit. Uh, and you know, if you can control it, control, it. get it done, do it. And if you can't control it, let it go. If it's, you know, she was like any day it could take her. And then one day it did, but she was like, I can't control when that's going to happen. So I'm going to live today. I'm going to control today. And that's something that, you know, slaps a whole lot of perspective in us grown folks who think, we got problems. Uh, there's a, there's a, I, I study. this is totally random, but I studied with this guy who was a tracker and a survivalist. And I spent time in New, New, the New Jersey Pine Barrens, like learning how to, you know, build uh, shelters out of leaves and like, you know, for a couple of weeks. It sounds... was, it was amazing. I was in my early twenties. So it was like, you know, just like two or three years ago. And, you know, <laughs> I, I remember, Right. They they had this saying which I thought was so beautiful. He would he would say, the thing if you live in safety, security, and comfort, those are the moments. The moments you will always remember are the moments where you do not have safety, security, and comfort. Because those are the three things that we need as people. You need safety, security, and comfort to to feel like you know that you can live and do your thing. But the true moments, if you really think about the moments in your life that mattered to you, that had true meaning. One, two, or three of those things were missing, and there was an element of the unknown and some danger, and 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 th that's really living. So yeah, I agree. You can't do that all the time, but if you kind of seek it out and you're like you said, not afraid to lean into that, that's yeah. when life gets really interesting. You can't do it all the time, but if you never do it, you got a problem. Yeah. <laughs> then you're, then you ain't doing it right. You know what I mean? It's a uh, you you've got to. You got to scare the hell out of yourself sometimes. Uh, and that doesn't mean physically endanger yourself. Although that's not entirely wrong either. As long as you're being smart and safe about it. I have a friend who jumps out of airplanes on the regular, um, you know, uh, but you know, 
you, if it's pure safety and security, then you're just playing defense. There's a way, you know, like I, there's an analogy that you buy a house, you feel like things are getting unsafe outside. So you get locks on your doors, you get more locks on your doors, you put some bars in your window, you start reinforcing, we're going to put bars around. Next thing you know, it's no longer a house, it's a prison. Um, there, you can protect yourself to the point of living in a prison. And that's not useful. Again, moderation in all things, including moderation. Um, so you've got to find something. You've got to find a harmony in the middle of that. Totally. Last thing I'll say about it is, you know, sometimes I'll be in the gym and I'll just be like, you know what? I'm going to go up five pounds because I don't even <laughs> care. I don't, everyone's looking at me anyway. I'm just going to go for it. And that's the kind of danger I live in. So I just and then you just look around everybody saying, you just say, yeah, this is happening. That's yeah. right. This is going down. No, I, do not need a spot. Everybody back up. I just and after you throw it up, after, pounds. And after you throw up that 70 pounds, <laughs> then you uh then you jump up and say, Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? That's why right. I'm a VIP at the gym, baby. And then then I get these calls on my cell phone. Can you come pick up your husband? <laughs> He's performing again. So yeah, yeah, that that happens. Well, switching gears, um, a topic that you are really passionate about, which Scott and I are also passionate about, is gun safety. And yes. I actually had to research this because I wanted to share with our audience the severity of this epidemic that's going on in this country. And I was heartbroken to learn that, you know, today being January 11th, in the first 11 days of 2022, we've already experienced 25 mass shootings with 18 people who have been killed and dozens injured. So from homes to the streets, to the movie theaters, to schools, houses of worship and stores, no place really seems safe or sacred anymore. And so we seem to be desensitized to all this killing and violence. And thoughts and prayers just don't work and aren't cutting it anymore. So what can we, the American citizens who are sick and tired of living in fear like this, what can we do to actually make a difference on this issue? There are little things that you can do. Obviously, the reality is so many of the problems we have, they're, they're isolating laws that will tremendously curb the issue. Tremendously curb the issue. I'll just give you an example. You know, so, so writing your Congress people, writing your senators, as pet and pedantic as that sounds, it's real. It makes a difference. Because right now, the reason why there's, because the reality is, I, I'm on the board of a, a group called the 97%. Uh, and it's called 97% because 90% of all Americans believe in the basic common sense gun safety laws that we talk about. There's no one, mo gun owners, 90% of gun owners, the vast majority of gun owners agree with universal background checks. But there should be no way you escape making sure that you don't have a violently criminal, you know, violent criminal record before you buy a gun. Everybody's like, I'm good with that. You know, if I got to wait three days for you to figure out and make sure that I'm not, you know, a terrorist, make sure I'm not uh, a wife beater, make sure I'm not going to rob a bank. That's probably a good thing. Gun owners believe in that. Non-gunners believe in that. We all agree on that. So why aren't those laws getting passed? And the answer is because there are the people who have to pass the laws and they are deathly afraid for their jobs. They, many of them are live in fear of losing their jobs. Again, talk about fear of being bullshit. And we need to remind them. The emperor has no clothes. You're afraid of a monster that does not really exist because the vast majority of us want you to do that. So we need to write them directly. We need to post on social media because at a certain point in time, when you hear, even within your echo chamber, people talking about it, you know, even though we've managed to, we have a very politicized country, but when you start to hear people on all sides saying, yo, let's do something, let's, this, this is wrong. Nobody wants innocent people to die from gun violence. The most, the biggest gun nuts in the world don't want that to happen. I remember this is a, this one guy I follow who's a self-proclaimed gun nut. That's what he calls himself. I love guns. I want that one. I want that one. I want that one. He's got a video talking about all the guns he wants, but he's also started a program where he will say to veterans, if you're in a bad place, meaning PTSD, and you're actually considering hurting yourself, maybe you need to give your guns to your friends. Like as big a gun nut as he is. He totally gets there's a point where I need to not have these in my house if I'm in a dark place. 
And those are things that, you know, the politicization, nobody wants to talk about. And nobody wants innocent people to die. Nobody wants innocent people to commit suicide. Let's have that conversation. And that's that's the part that incenses me. So speaking out on social media and having the conversation with friends and not just people that it's easy to have a conversation with. And don't start with preaching. Start with just saying, do you care that innocent people die from gun violence? And when they so people, when, as soon as they hear that it's a political conversation, they want to go, no, no, no. So you're going to try and get it. No, no, no. I'm just literally asking a genuine question because I don't want innocent people to die. And I'm guessing that you don't want innocent people to die either. If we can agree on that, then we can start to work from there and let's have a conversation. I mean, like just an example of some of the laws that are uh, that people are percolating about these red flag laws. They make sense. They make sense. Basically, it's a red flag law where if the spouse or family of someone registers that they have issues and there's ways to market it that everybody can agree on. For example, 25 percent of mass shootings in the stats you just rattled off. Mass shootings are defined by people who, uh, where four people are shot or more. 25% of all mass shootings are committed by people who are convicted of spousal abuse. Yep. So let's say we have a law that says if you're convicted of spousal abuse, you lose all your guns. That will maybe, I'm sure it's not going to get rid of all that, you know, a full 25% of mass shootings, but it's going to put a massive dent in it. Uh, and not for nothing, that spouse that's been abused is probably going to live safer, live longer. It's a good thing. And who's going to argue for the spousal abuser? Who's going to argue that, no, I want him to keep his gun? No, it, it, that you don't want to be on the side of that argument. That's an easy law that I think we can all agree on. And the more we speak about it, the more it becomes obvious that that's where the will of the people is. The more we can actually get politicians to stop being afraid of this boogie monster that doesn't really exist. Uh, and the boogie monster, you know, we point out the NRA, but the reality is the NRA has its own problems and corruption issues and everything like that. And it's collapsing under its own weight. But the NRA started it. The boogie monster got away from it. And now it's this monster that is so decentralized and people and people politicize it. I've had full on conversations and I'm sorry, I've, I've totally run on a, a rant here, but it, it just it, it, it incenses me because I have a dear friend who was a gun collector and I enjoy shooting guns. I'm a good shot. It pisses off my friends because when the when the gun safety advocate is a better shot than you, <laughs> uh, it's, 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 it's not a good look for you. Um, but this friend is a gun collector and over a beer, completely willing to acknowledge that, you know, in South Carolina, the idea that I can roll up, punk down my license, get a six pack of beer and a gun, it's probably not a good idea. Especially if like, you know, my wife and I just had an argument. I need a bottle of Jim Beam. Need idea. Making me wait a second. I'm making background check. That all helps. Let me, do I abuse my spouse? Have I had issues with my spouse? That's all a good thing to do. He'll acknowledge that over a beer. Cut to a few days later when Obama was having his town hall meeting on guns. Hardcore, no compromise, and that's what they call the movement now—the no compromise movement. Uh, you know, hardcore, no compromise. They're trying to, and I was like. What happened? And the answer is, it was officially a political conversation now, and everybody goes to their tribal corners. And it's like, no, we're, we're all Americans. Let's try and solve the problem instead of win the fight. I have no interest in winning the fight. I want to solve the problem. We could definitely go down the rabbit hole on this one, but I uh, just to my response is just we have to get better at seeing each other as just human beings. Uh, not that you're a Republican, I'm a Democrat, an independent, whatever. No, it's just you're a person, I'm a person. But let's, and I, I've told Amy this, I, I really believe this, you know, like if you and I are looking at something and it's a tree and I go, uh, the, there's a problem because the, the tree's leaning over the house and, you know, we're going to have to do something. So we've got to do something about this tree. And you look at me and you go, that's not a tree. What are you talking about? That's an orange. I'm like, what? And that's where we are right now, where like one person is like, this looks like a tree. And another person goes, this looks like an orange. We have to get back to the place where we can just both look at a problem and go, this is a problem. And we both agree about the facts of the problem. We can disagree about what to do about it. But hey, let's just agree. We want to have a better, safer world, a better, safer country. And we're both people and let's forget about the politics and let's just talk like people. And that's how we'll get somewhere, you know?
100%. I, I'm, I'm, like I said, the politicization becomes people wouldn't trying to win the fight. And they said, this is the interesting thing. I was listening to this podcast and they said that uh, the problem with our politics right now is that people treat politics the way we treat sports. When I tell you I'm an Eagles fan, so when I tell you how much I hate the Cowboys, and my mom's a super Cowboys fan, so I tell her how much the Cowboys garbage, blah, 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 we go back and forth. I'm not trying to convince her to become an Eagles fan. I have no interest in her becoming an Eagles fan, and she has no interest in me becoming a Cowboys fan. That's the fun of sports, because sports is just this fun thing unto itself. But when you start treating politics like that, when it just becomes, I'm going to score points on you and score point, and you're going to try to score points on me, it becomes about winning the fight. That's just for the fight's sake. You're just in the fight just for the sake of fighting. Uh, and we're never actually trying to do anything. That's the problem. If we're trying to solve a problem, don't win the fight, solve the problem. And then you're actually, then I have to listen to anybody who has a good idea. I have to listen to anything that makes sense. I have to be open to anything and everything. I'm from Virginia. Virginia is one of the original purple states. Uh, I tell friends, I'm like, look, I, I speak purple pretty fluently um, because there are, there's virtually no reasonable issue on the right that I can't hear and extract something that I agree with in it. And then the things that I can't agree with, I'll point out why they're unreasonable. Yeah. And I'll be like, that's not you trying to solve people's problems. That's you wanting the world to be the way you want it to be. That's you wanting the world, the world to be your world, you know, wanting everybody to have your religion, wanting everybody to do, and those kind of things, you know. Uh, and I'll say it to my friends on the left as well. You know, I've been in, I've been in panel discussions where we're talking about gun uh, safety issues, and there's a guy out there who's just spoiling to get into a conversation. He's talking about how in California it's impossible to get a gun, and they make it impossible. And I said, do you own a gun? He said, what? I said, do you own a gun? He said, well, yeah. I said, so then it's not impossible. He said, no, but it's, I said, but you own a gun. So your point is it's hard. I said, I just want us to stop speaking in a hyperbole and extremes and absolutes. You want it to be easier to get a gun and you want to be able to take that gun anywhere and everywhere with you at all times. Now you can get a gun and you get how like, you know, and I can agree with you on protecting yourself in your house. I can just, when you're out in the world, on a bad day when you're angry, how do I know the road rage won't cause? I said, you know, you see where it gets complicated in your house, that's your world. Once you get outside, I said, so, you know, let's not talk in absolutes. You can get your gun. What you want is absolutely no restrictions on it. And that's where we've got to have a conversation. And then this other woman said, you know what? Let's stop kidding around with it. We got to take all the guns. We got to get the guns and get out. I said, now you're my problem. Now I got a problem with you. The Second Amendment exists for a reason. The reality is protecting your home is a real thing. I get it. You know, hunting is a real thing. And uh, and so I was when you do that and he saw me do that, his perspective on me changed when he realized I'm very seriously not trying to take all your guns. I'm trying to figure out how fewer innocent people die. And if you're down for that, then we can have the conversation. Uh, I'm not trying to take your gun, but I also want you to acknowledge that, you know, this is, you know, he's, he wanted to have his gun in his car, whatever he wanted to, because, you know, it's an unsafe world. I said, yeah, but here's the problem. How do I know that you're the safe person? Right. You know, we see people have road rage and shoot somebody else. He goes, yeah, well, I mean, somebody who's unsafe shouldn't have it. I go, but everybody, I know I can drive my car at 80 miles an hour. I'm a good driver and I'm very good at 80 miles an hour. But I also fully acknowledge that the speed limit says 65 for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> because anybody on any given day will crash their car including me. And so suddenly, why is it when my kids are in the car, I don't do 80 miles an hour. Yeah. I slow it down and I play it more safe. We, need, we, we have laws in place for a reason to slow us down. We need some laws to slow us all down when it comes to this gun conversation. We need to acknowledge that because we have an issue that no one else on this planet has. Canada has more guns per capita than we have as a fraction of the gun violence. We've fallen in love with this mythology. And I don't know if that's going to change because I love a good action flick more than anybody else. Uh, and I don't think action films are the problem. I think when people begin to uh, fetishize the idea that, you know, look, I, I love action films. I love good shoot 'em ups. I love superhero films. I also don't have dynamite in my house, and I don't believe that I can swing from a web over the <laughs> over, over New York City skyline. Yeah. There's a perspective there that you need, you need to maintain. And, you know, we have people who are creating communities that – purposely avoid keeping perspective when it comes to responsible gun ownership.
we all need to get educated about the work that you're doing with the 97% and see how we can support and write to our representatives, as you said, and be loud on social media so that things will finally change. We have the midterms coming up, so we all can't sleep on this. It's super important. People got to get out there and rock the vote um, because so much is at stake. Um, and so our last question to you, Jason, that we ask all of our wonderful guests is, what do you want your legacy to be? Wow. Um, let's get deep for a second. Um, what, do, what do I want my legacy to be? Um, first and foremost, I'm a father. I mean, literally, you know, I tell friends, like, yo, you, you figure out a, uh, there's a motto for companies and there's, you know, there's a log line for every movie and they say that every, anything that's not that log line needs to get kicked out. Uh, you know, I'm a father first, foremost, and forever. Uh, so I want my kids to grow up to be people that I not only love, but respect. You know, not only love, but respect them and like them. Uh, and knock wood, that's, that's happening in spades and it makes me cry when I think about it. Uh, the, uh, the other thing I w I'd want to have, uh, you know, have entertained people, have given chance of people to entertain and perhaps even educated people through the work that I do as an actor to put, you know, the whole point of the whole thing that drew me to being an actor was when you play somebody else, you learn something about yourself. I would never do blah, 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 blah. Until you have to play that character, you've got to find that part of yourself that is capable of forgiving someone who murdered someone you love. Uh, that is capable of murdering someone you love. You, you access those things and you find you're a much bigger human being than you thought. Uh, and when you perform that, other people see that and live vicariously through it. And then they find that part of themselves and they recognize I could be dangerous. So let me not put myself in situations that will make me dangerous. I can be far more loving than I ever thought. So let me, let me try and love more. Uh, you know, so I, I, wanted, I want the work to have moved people and just enjoy people. And then, you know, uh, there's a phrase that some friends in college taught me back in the day that said, uh, uh, all you hold in your cold, dead hand is that which you've given away. And that's another version of you can't take it with you. Um, and that's not just financially, but it's spiritually and everything else. So, you know, sports analogy, leave it on the floor. You know, so show up. Do something for somebody else. Yes, move the needle in your own life. Move the needle in the people that you care about's lives. But then move the needle for people that you won't even see. And that'll make you, you sleep a little better at night, I think. And I, when I have the big sleep, uh, I'd love for, you know, I'd love to sleep easy knowing that I, I hopefully move the needle for some people who I never met. That's beautiful. And you're, you're doing it. I mean, we, we've been able to witness it firsthand and you are so generous with your, with your time and your talent. As we said before, you always answer the call for help. They say. And that's because you, you all are amazing. You are amazing. So when you call, I know it's a real conversation about something that's worth having a conversation about, you know, because it's, you, it's easy to spread yourself incredibly thin. And, but, um, you all put such tremendous thought behind everything you do. And so when you call, I, I know it's a worthwhile conversation to have. And I, I'm down to support always. Thank you. Thank you. That means so much to us. Jason, you are an incredible talent, but even a more incredible human being. And we're just grateful for all the wonderful ways in which you're making a difference in the world. And thank you for being a guest on our show. We cannot cool. wait to share your inspiring story with our audience. And of course, all the Grays and Station 19 fans, um, make sure you guys tune in on February 24th. It's going to be main event TV. Off the chain. That's right. It's going to be ridiculous. It's going to be ridiculous. <laughs> We're gonna see. We're gonna see Dr. Ben Warren do some crazy stunts, rappelling down <laughs> a mountain, and keeping my fingers crossed for Dr. Owen Hunt. He's yes. my my OG Bay from the show, so <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully he makes it out alive. Um, fingers and, crossed. Uh, fingers crossed. Yes, yes, yes. Well, thank you for the time and the love today, Jason. You're the best. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for having me on. This has been a blast. This is fun. 
Hey guys, if you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star rating and a great review. We would definitely appreciate it. And uh, you can subscribe wherever podcasts are found. You can also find us on YouTube and watch the show and subscribe there as well. And whoa, today's guest was exceptional. Thank you so much, Jason George, for being a guest on the True Heart Podcast, sharing all of your incredible stories from Station 19 and Grey's Anatomy, and more importantly, about the beautiful work that you're doing every day to make a difference in the world. He did not give up any spoilers, though. I tried my best, people. He set some traps, but he was like, come on. So that just he shows laughed, you. He laughed at your traps. Yeah, I mean, it just shows you Shonda Rhimes totally trains her stars very well. Keep February 24th on lockdown. That's right. It's already in my calendar. I sent Scott an invite. He knows that from 8 to 10 p.m., I will be reserved for the Station 19 Grey's Anatomy crossover event. <laughs> and I cannot wait to see Jason rappel down a mountain and hopefully save Dr. Owen Hunt. So to all the fans out there, um, don't miss yeah, out. I, I, I'm, I'm in. I'm watching it. I'm watching it. it you, I got to see what happens you, now. You have to watch it. Um, yeah, the, the hype is like off the charts. I mean, I can't even believe that they've made us wait now for like over a month. Um, but it's going to be so worth it. I know it's going to be one Must of those that bad. It's like emotional premieres. It's that much for you. you had to wait a month. I know. Well, when you think about like Game of Thrones made you wait, I think it was like a year and a two half, years. two years yeah. to the, the finale. I guess waiting a month is not that bad. So, all right. I forgive you, Grey's and, and Station 19 <laughs> producers. You'd forgive them anyway. That, that's true. I, I love the show. <laughs> You're all good. Um, but thanks again, Jason. What an awesome episode. And yeah, come back next week. We have another amazing guest coming up and in the meantime uh stay safe and have a beautiful day thanks guys